Well, tonight we're going to talk uh, about standing in the gap. Um, there are so many times where people have stood and um, stood for this nation, stood for uh, the loss, um, you know, standing, uh, believing God. I say standing, but on their knees. You know, trusting God to cause some things to happen in the earth that wouldn't happen any other way. And so when I think about um, standing in the gap, a lot of people will say, like, you know, intercession, and, and, and that is, you know, because really, well, let me just give you a, a, a couple of definitions about what intercession is or basically what is standing in the gap. So intercession is standing in the gap in prayer between a person or persons who have provoked judgment upon themselves through their wrongdoing and the actual execution of that judgment. Simply put, intercession is prayer to hold back judgment. Now, um, when you think about intercessory prayer, who, is, who intercedes for us? Who's constantly interceding for us? Jesus is, right? And before we were born again, those of us that were born again, he was standing, the, he was, he's the mediator between God and man. He took our place. He became our substitute. He stood in the gap, but the Bible also says that he ever lives to make intercession for us. So Jesus is constantly praying for us. I'm so thankful that he's praying for me. I don't know about you, but I need all the prayer that I can get, you know? <laughs> Praise God. Um, so we, but we are also um, given this, um, I guess you could say, in one sense, this ability to, to pray. We, we are priests, right? Remember, um, we are royal priesthood. Remember in the Old Testament, the priests were the ones that went into the uh, presence of God on behalf of the people, right? So the people didn't go in. They went in and they went in and they um, made atonement for their sins, they brought the sacrifice, they went all through all the rituals that they had to do. So they were doing that on behalf of the people. Well, we know when Jesus died, he took over that. He, you know, so he died once and for all. And so he does, we don't have to praise God, we don't have to slaughter goats and lambs and all that stuff because the Lamb of God, you know, took our place and he became that ultimate sacrifice. But, um, but the Bible says that we are, we are priests. So we have the ability um, through prayer to stand in the gap for others. Now, one of the um, things that the Bible tells us to stand in the gap for is our nation. And so if you, um, let's just turn to Second Chronicles. I know you're familiar with this scripture, but... Um, Praise the Lord. Let's turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. If you would do that with me. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. I am getting there. So it says here, I can quote it, but I want to read it. It says, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. Now, God is saying here, he's saying, if my people which we are the people of God, right? We're the people of God. It says, if my people will humble themselves. 
So it, it's not, um, it's not the politicians, it's not, uh, you know, the senators, it's not this person or that person, even though they could be because perhaps they're Christians as well. But God is saying, my people, in other words, he's talking about, in our case, the body of Christ, the church. He's talking about us. We are his people. We are the ones that God is calling to stand in the gap for the land. You know, and God is expecting us, needing us to do that. Um, John Wesley said this, and you've heard Pastor uh, say this in, as well. It says, it seems that God is limited by our prayer life, that he can do nothing for humanity unless someone asked him. We have to petition God. We have to ask God. We, we have to be the ones that will stand in the gap, who will take time to pray. Many Christians, I won't, well, yeah, I'll say that. Not in here, not here, not at this church. We're a praying church. But many times Christians don't value the importance of prayer. You know, prayer is, um, of course, we are fellowshipping with God. But another part of prayer is getting things done in the earth, causing things that God desires to be accomplished, to be done in the earth when we pray, when we fall on our knees, and when we cry out to God. You know, we have so many examples in the Bible where people called out to God, and it moved heaven. Something changed. Um, you know, the children of Israel, when they were in Egypt, they were crying out to God. God sent Moses. Um, we think about when um, Peter was in jail and, and his company was praying for him, and God sent an angel, and he was released from prison. You know, he walked out of prison. Um, you know, so many other things that we could talk about where when people have cried out to God, God has been faithful to send an answer. You know, when Daniel prayed, um, you know, the angel got to him and said, you know, Daniel had prayed, and he said, you know, the moment you prayed, the answer was on its way, but it was hindered. But yet and still, the moment he prayed, God was in action. God had the answer on the way. And, you know, tonight I, I, I somewhat struggled a little bit about, you know, what I should talk about. Uh, not so much, you know, when I say struggle, because I want to say what God wants me to say. How about that? Okay. So as, a, as, a, as the body of Christ... As this local church, prayer is essential, <laughs> that word. But it is. It's an essential part of who we are. It's an essential part of what we've become. We could not have gotten where we are without prayer. This church was started with prayer. You know, pastor sought God. Wanted to know what should he do. I mean, he got the name. He got where he was supposed to go. He got the name of the church. All of that was in prayer. Um, you know, as we grew, he, he prayed about where, we sh where should we hold church at? You know, what facilities should we be in? When we brought this land, he prayed and we prayed, you know, God, is this the place? Is this the land that we should buy? So it's all been prayer. It's all been prayer. Praying the people in. You know, there were times where we, we would believe, we would say, I think we start out, at one point we were saying, we believe God for 50 people. Then we believe God for 100 people. Then, you know, the numbers kept increasing. And, we're, you know, we've been saying we believe God for 2,000 people. And so, but all of that's been bathed in prayer. It doesn't just come to pass just because it's a thought just because it's somebody's desire. God is the only one who can move people's hearts. God is the only one who can change, really change things. And when I think of all the things that are even going on in our world today, no matter how you slice it, in the end, without God, there is no answer. 
Without him being in the center of it, there is no answer. Without the children of God falling on their knees, petitioning God, going to God, standing in the gap for this nation, there is no real answer. There is no answer other than the word of God and God's people standing in the gap for America. You know, if you want to see things change in America, then pray. Pray. God will hear the cry of your heart. Now, I know people do practical things, and I'm not saying that, you know, there aren't some practical things that we shouldn't do or whatever, but I am saying that it needs to be bathed in prayer because we need to get our assignments from him. You know, if we just go out there on a limb, <laughs> you don't know what you might end up with. If you just go out there on your feelings, or on your thoughts, you know, God says, my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. My ways are higher than your ways. God has, knows exactly what he wants to happen in America. And if you go to him and get his mind, then you will have the will of God. And you will have what the word says. So like it says in, in Peter, it says, I exhort, therefore, that prayers... Supplications, giving of thanks, be made for men, for kings, and for all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. This is what God is saying. He's saying, here's your answer. You want to live in, in quietness? You want to live in peace? Then do this. Do this. Here's your answer. People are want to know, well, how can we have peace in America? How can we, you know, how can we get things to change? God is saying, do it my way. Do it the way I have commanded you to do. Don't do your way. Don't do your thing. Ask me. Come to me. Trust me. Look to me. I have the answer. He has the answer. He knows everything. He knows. I don't know everything. Neither do you. <laughs> right? But God knows. And God is looking to his people to pray. We have an election before us. You know, I'm not going to get into who you should vote for. You need to ask God. You need to pray yourself. You need to get the mind of Christ. You need to get the heart of God yourself. That's on you. But my heart is this. We must pray. God is saying my people must pray. They must pray for my will, not their will. You know, when Jesus taught, taught the disciples to pray... He said in Matthew chapter 6, when he was teaching them about the Lord's Prayer, he told them, pray this way. And what did he say? He says, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And then he said, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. He didn't say, my will be done. He didn't tell them, you pray, your will be done. He said, you pray, the Father's will be done. We are looking for God's will. At least that's what I'm looking for. I want the will of God. See, when I know that I'm in the will of God, I got a whole lot of peace. I tell you, the storms can come and go. Stuff can happen all around me. But when I know that I'm in the will of God, it's like, you know what? It's on, but I'm standing I'm secure. I'm anchored. And it's the same way that God wants us to be. He wants his children to be anchored. He wants his children to have such confidence that they are in his will and that when they pray and ask God, he hears them and he answers them. Praise God. Now I'm so far off my notes, but that's okay. <laughs> so... Um, in, in Ezekiel chapter 22, it says 
that God said, I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it, but I found none. That's in Ezekiel 22, 30 and 31. He said, I sought for a man. See, God is a God of mercy. He's a God of love and he's a God of mercy. But you know what? There is that judgment side. And if nobody stands in the gap, if nobody petitions, you know, like um, Moses did with Miriam, when Miriam and Aaron, they were running their mouth about Moses, his wife, and, you know, and then they were saying, well, you know, God speaks to us just like he speaks to Moses. And you know what? Oh, I, was, I was reading that, and God said to them, he said, um, come here. He, he told Miriam, come here. He told Aaron, come here. He told Moses, come here. He told all three of them to come. And then he lit into Aaron and, and um, Miriam. I'm paraphrasing, but you get my gist, right? He was not pleased with them because they were talking against his anointed. And Moses, and well then, before I say that, then um, Miriam got leprosy. Praise the Lord. Don't talk against our pastors. I'm not saying you're going to get leprosy. (laughs) But that's not wise. All right? Praise the Lord. Um, But in this case... Moses interceded for her. You know, Aaron looked and said, oh, no, I don't want, oh, my goodness. And he's like, Moses, pray. <laughs> you know, Moses prayed and God heard his prayer. And after seven days, she was able to come back into the camp. And she was no longer, lep- had leprosy. But he had to stand in the gap. He had to pray. God had mercy on her because Moses prayed, because Moses stood in the gap. And Moses stood in the gap more than once with the children of Israel. Several times he stood in the gap. And God had mercy. You know, at some point, God was like, I'm just going to get rid of all of them. I'm going to start all over. (laughs) Moses like, Lord, but if you do that, they're going to say that you couldn't get them into the promised land. Don't, don't do that. You don't want to do that. He stood in the gap. Same thing with, with Abraham. You know, some people think that our nation is horrible. You know, that we, we are just, America is just terrible. That's what some people think. But it couldn't be terrible with the body of Christ in it. It can't be terrible with with God's children in it. Amen? But you think about Sodom and Gomorrah. Abraham stood in the gap. He went all the way down to, you know, God, if there are ten righteous people in the city, will you not destroy it? And God said, I won't. I won't destroy it. So there's more than ten of us in here. And if we pray and say, God, have mercy on America, have mercy, have grace upon us, forgive us for our sins. We are sorry where we've missed it, Father God. We're sorry that we have not stood on the principles that this nation was built upon. We're sorry that we've deviated from what you initially intended for this nation to be and to do. Forgive us, Father God. Do you know he will hear our cry? And there are people who are crying out. There are people in this room. I know. I'm positive. Without even asking, I'm sure there are many of you that are crying out and calling on God. Why do you think that America is being saved? Because of your prayers. Because somebody's standing in the gap. Because somebody is petitioning God. And saying, Father, please have mercy. Have mercy upon us. 
We have so much power and so much authority in this earth. But we have to exercise it. We have to utilize it. Praise God. Um, Brother Hagin said this. He said, Satan's authority over matters on the earth can only be overcome as Christians pray in behalf of their country. God is longing today for someone who will make up the hedge and stand in the gap before him for the land. He said that in the, his book, The Art of Prayer. Um, you know, I work with the children, so, you know, sometimes my examples have to do with children's movies. <laughs> but this one isn't really a children's movie. Um, th- this one is a Cinderella movie, so I like Cinderella, too. Okay, like Cinderella movies. There's a bunch of them out there. But um, this particular one was the version that, that was, it came out in 2015, and it was the one with Lily James, um, and she was the she was Cinderella, starred as Cinderella. Well, there was a scene at toward the end where uh, her stepmother and stepsister were brought before the king and the queen, and they asked, "Is there anybody here? Basically, will say something good. Is there anybody here who will, you know, um, intercede on their behalf? Or is there?" Anybody who has something good that can present something good about them. And there was nobody. No one. It was total silence. Nobody had anything good to say. Nobody came to their rescue. Nobody came. Nobody stood in the gap for them. Nobody said, have mercy on them. No one. Well, we can't let that be. We can't. We can't. You know, when God says, I'm looking for somebody to pray, we can't say, I don't have time to pray. We can't say, oh, you know, um, you know, use our mouths for other things like complaining and whining and, and, and uh, you know, things that don't accomplish anything. We can't use our mouths for that. That, that doesn't get us any place. But your prayers make a difference. The effectual, fervent prayer in James 5, 16. What does it say? The effectual, fervent prayers of a righteous man makes much power available, right? Your prayers make much power available. They they give God something to work with. When you stand in the gap, or on your knees in the gap, and you're praying. You're giving God something to work with. You're giving him something to, 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 you know, in heaven. Heaven is receiving those prayers. Those prayers are being brought before the Father. Jesus is saying, Father, they're praying, you know, in my name. They're praying according to your will. You know, so we've got to do. We've got to move. We've got to make things happen. The angels are moving Things are happening. Things are taking place. So, you know, I've heard many times um, as far as uh, our nation being in a crisis. If it is, it's because the church, the body of Christ, has not done its part. Let's just be honest. It's because we haven't done our part. So we need to change that. We need to change it. Um, I quoted earlier 1 Timothy 2, verses 1 through 2. Um, I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. So we're to pray for everybody, saved and unsaved. We're supposed to pray for kings, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. So God is saying, this is what I want you to do. This is what I'm instructing you to do. I want you to stand in the gap. I want you to, you know, supplications, that's an earnest heartfelt prayer. Um, Then intercessions, you know, that's when you're standing in the gap when, 
when, you know, to stave off um, judgment. But God is saying, I need you to pray all these different types of prayers. And then he says, for kings and for all who are in authority. So it is right for us to pray for those who are in authority. Pray for our president. Pray for our vice president. Pray for the Senate, the House of Representatives, you know. Pray for those who are in authority. It's also right for us to pray for our pastors. They, too, they have spiritual authority. It's right to pray for them. We should pray for them. We should lift them up um, just as much as um, we would lift up our own family. You know, um, I, um, for me, I, I, my prayer time is usually first thing in the morning. And um, so I, I start out many times with this scripture in Timothy. Um, you know, I, I may worship God for a little bit and, and praise God and pray in the Spirit sometimes. It just depends on how the Holy Spirit leads me. But I'm endeavoring to pray for those who are in authority. And I pray for my pastors. I pray for uh, the staff. I pray for uh, the school staff and the church staff. I pray for their families. I pray for... Um, you know, some of our other um, sister churches, you know, Pastor uh, Tony Sharon, uh, Pastor David Van Buren. I, I pray for people. I, I, you know, it's important. I pray for, for the church as a whole, you know, our church. I pray for the families in our church. I pray for people. Um, why? Because prayer is important. And I don't know everything that's going on in everybody's life, but I know if I pray, I know who does know, and there are times when the Holy Spirit will put somebody on my heart, and I pray for that person. I pray in the Holy Ghost because I don't know what's going on, but I know he knows. So I begin to pray in other tongues. Um, there are people, there's this young man that I've been praying for. He doesn't know Jesus. Um, he's in a situation that I'm just like, Lord, you know, I need you to work in this situation. I need you to work in this life. I'm standing the gap for him. He needs Jesus. I don't want him to leave this earth without knowing Jesus. You know, I intercede for my loved ones that are not saved. The reason why I'm saying this to you is because you, you can always pray. <laughs> In fact, the Bible says to pray without ceasing. Now, we know that's not like, you know, you just don't do anything else but pray because you can't pray while you're eating. Um, you don't usually pray while you're sleeping. Uh, at least I don't. <laughs> Some of you might snore, but I don't think you pray. <laughs> um, you know, you may not be able to really pray when you're at work. Uh, maybe you can pray quietly or whatever, but then maybe you can't. So, you know, there are certainly times, obviously, that we can't pray. So it doesn't mean that, but it means don't give up on prayer. Never give up on prayer. Always see prayer as a viable solution. Always see prayer as something that you can turn to at any time of the day, night, night. And if you pray according to the will of God, you can get your prayers answered. Amen? So we have, have such a, um, a privilege to pray, to be a part of what God is doing in the earth. I just think that is just amazing, that God would say to his children, I want you to pray, and if you'll pray, I'll do. Wow. Now, when I think about my pastors and praying for them, I pray for them to have wisdom. I pray for them, of course, to be um, strong and healthy and healed and, and prosperous and to be anointed and, uh, you know, delivered and, and watched over and whatever they need, you know, I, I, I pray for that. I pray for them to um, 
have a good relationship in their family, their marriage. You know, I, I pray, pray for those things. Um, pastors are on the front line. And they need our prayers. I was looking at this. Let's see if I can find it real quick. There was, um, it's been a while, but there was uh, an article that I had read about pastors needing prayer. And it says, it says this. It says, um, as never before, pastors are under attack spiritually, emotionally, and physically. Satan is doing everything possible to destroy pastors across the nation. Pastors leave the ministry for, uh, um, pastors leaving the ministry have risen to epidemic proportions. Every month, 1,700 pastors leave the ministry. That's almost 55 a day. It says, your pastors face spiritual and emotional attacks every day. The expectation placed on pastors are enormous. Pastors are expected to be super Christians. Powerful leaders, steadfast theologians, financial wizards, and fundraisers meet every need of every person in the church, work 60 to 70 hours a week, and maintain a perfect home life. That's, that, that isn't even fair to have those type of expectations, but some people do. So the pastor is to have the wisdom of Solomon, preach like the Apostle Paul, have the faith of Peter, lead like a CEO, be a counselor, psychologist, have the mercy of Mother Teresa, and walk in humility. <laughs> now, <laughs> isn't that ridiculous? But yet and still, that's what some people's expectations are of their pastors. Like, well, wait a minute. That's not right. So as the expectations have risen, the respect for pastors has plummeted. In a recent list of most respected professionals, the pastors came in just above car salesmen. Now, we all know what I don't know if anybody's a car salesman in here. And I'm not talking, you know, I'm not putting everybody in a box, but, you know, there people have certain thoughts about car salesmen. So, but it says here, Satan knows that as the pastor goes, so goes the church. If he can destroy pastors, then he can ruin churches. Every 7,000 churches, every year 7,000 churches close their doors. As never before, your pastor needs people like you praying for him. Our pastors need our prayers. They have a mandate of God upon them to fulfill the will of God, the calling of God on their lives. But we are part of that. We are to hold their arms up. We are to do that by praying and, of course, you know, serving and, and being a part of the ministry and doing all the things that we need to do, be a functioning, vital, lively part of the ministry. But we're to stand in the gap. You know, I, uh, when our, our staff prays, I, I kind of envision us all standing shoulder to shoulder, our arms locked, and our pastors in the middle. And it's like, Nothing's coming through us. No attack. Nothing. You know, and so we are, if something tries to come, we ward it off. You know, so what we do with our prayer life is so important. Your time in prayer is so vital to the fulfillment of the will of God in this earth. If you want to see things change, stand in the gap. Pray. Pray. We should pray for one another as well. We should supplicate for one another. We should um, have earnest, heartfelt prayers for one another. When we see our brothers and our sisters under a challenge or being challenged or 
if we see their marriage being challenged or if we see them having a challenge with their children or their finances or just their mind or their job, whatever it may be, instead of talking about them and talking about their situation, talk to God and say, Father, they need you. You know, um, if it's a situation on the job, you know, Father, you promised that uh, we would have favor with you and favor with man. I pray that you give uh, Cindy favor with their boss, with her boss. I thank you, Father God, that you turn that situation around, that you make it so that she has um, favor where she gets the best uh, job, she gets promotion, she gets, you know, and you can just pray that way. Um, when you are doing that, you are interceding for that person, you're supplicating for that person, you are making a difference in that person's life. And if you do that earnestly, God will move. God will change the situation. God will set the crooked places straight. He'll make things happen. That's the kind of God we serve. And he loves to um, do things for his children. And for those who have not yet accepted Jesus as well. Um, that's a whole nother subject um, that God, you know, as far as standing in the gap for the lost. It's so important, you know, that we don't, I have to remind myself because, you know, I work in the church. I'm in this building, not this building, but next door a lot. Um, and so a lot of times when I'm out and about, like, say, when I go to the grocery store, I just want to get in there, <laughs> get out and go home, you know. But I have to remember there are people around me. There are people who don't know Jesus. So I have to slow my roll down, as they say, and allow myself to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit and allow myself to um, think about somebody besides me and my four no more. Our neighbors, how many of you know, really know your neighbors? How many of you know your neighbors' names? You do, Caitlin, good, 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 that's good. We, our own neighborhood, do we even know our neighbors? Have we reached out to them? Have we prayed for them? Have we prayed and said, God, if they're not saved, you know, give me an opportunity or send labors across their path, but they're my neighbors. I want them saved. I don't want them going to hell. I'm telling you, if we get on God's program, we will never be bored. <laughs> and we will never have idle time either. <laughs> And we won't have time to be talking junk. We won't have time to be posting junk. I'm just saying. If you really get on God's plan, all that other stuff becomes secondary. In fact, for the most part, you don't even, it's not even important. It's not even important. So, I'm just saying... Tonight, I'm encouraging you to pray. In fact, I'm pretty much begging you, pray. Pray. We have prayer here on Tuesdays at 530. It's been opened up, so now you can come and you can join us. If you can't come to the building, you can watch online. Uh, we've continued to live stream it. We have pre-service prayer um, before the 8 o'clock service and then also before the uh, 6.30 service on Sundays. So there are opportunities to pray. But even in your own life, don't let your prayer life go. Make it a priority. It'll change your life. Just praying in the Holy Ghost. You know, sometimes... Um, you know, sometimes people make prayer this hard thing. It's like, oh, you know, I got, what do I got to, you know, 
It's like, no, just talk to God. And if you don't know what to say, pray in the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost will help you. And before you know it, you know, you're just gone. You're just in the spirit and you're just gone. And all of a sudden, oh, what happened? (laughs) It's not a hard thing, but it is an important thing and a vital thing. 